Welcome back to the channel. My name is Guido van der Waro. I'm an OM system ambassador and professional landscape slash nature photographer from the Netherlands. Uh, in today's video, I want to share to you my first half year experience with this, the OM1 Mark II from OM system. And I have to be real honest that I was sitting quite comfortable in my original OM1 chair uh, for about one and a half years. And I wasn't expecting a new camera or follow-up for this OM1. I was just really, really satisfied with this uh, camera. But when they announced the Mark II, uh, the first thing that I thought was, hmm, is this enough for a new camera? But as an ambassador, of course, uh, I could get a good deal on this camera. Um, and when you're on fairs, when you're doing uh, lectures, when you're teaching people on workshop about a camera, I think as an ambassador, you are just uh, obliged to use the latest model. And so I got this uh, Mark II and I started playing with it. And I want to show you in this video a lot of images that I took over the past six months. And um, in the end, I will do a little conclusion about uh, my experience. So I'm not going into the details of what this camera can do or can't do or uh, there are lots of those videos around i just want you to see the experience that i had with this camera and to jump a little bit ahead on the conclusion um, that i have for this camera it's actually very simple my my what i love most about this camera is that it brings back joy in photography it's small you can take all lenses with you that you want so you can be as flexible as you could ever dream of and all those functions that those this camera has uh, life and the live g and the uh, focus stacking um, high res shots yeah you just live composite for example all these features are in this camera and I have to admit, I am kind of a lazy photographer. I don't like to use filters in front of my camera. If I don't have to, I'm not going to do it. If I don't want to use a tripod, I want to use handheld shots. And even on the handheld high res shots, I can take some bloody good images with this camera. And yeah, it has just amazed me every time I'm out what this camera is capable of. Um, one of the things that I hear most of people is, well, it's still a 20 megapixel sensor. Yes, it is a 20 megapixel sensor, but it's more than enough. Uh, I always hear it from people that you can't print big with uh, a micro four thirds camera. Well, it's actually total bullshit. I've recently uh, purchased a new printer. Uh, you will see more of that in a latest video. Well, this is an A3 size print. Uh, the quality is absolutely amazing of this uh, image. And if that isn't big enough for you, this is an A2 size print. And the detail in this print is just absolute ridiculous. And the first question that I have is, how much bigger do you want to print? Is is your opinion that uh, you want to um, yeah, put it on a wall somewhere. Just remember that when you print big, you start walking backwards. You're not sitting like this on a big print. You're looking at it from a distance. So the bigger you print, the, the, the less those details matter. Look for a big painting. For example, here in the Netherlands, we have something called the Night Watch from... Uh, very famous painter it's a huge huge painting but nobody in that museum is standing a meter in front of it no everyone looks at it from across the room because you're not looking at those details you're looking at the whole picture and in this case this is an a2 size print so it's about 60 by 40 centimeters every single detail in those leaves in those rocks is in this print so i don't know how much bigger you want to print but in my opinion it just isn't necessary and 
when people say I want to be able to crop from uh, a full frame sensor because I, when I have 40 megapixels I can crop back but with the micro four thirds system and that's something you have to remember you don't have to crop you know when you're using a 300 millimeter lens on a full frame camera it's a 600 millimeter on the micro four thirds system so a lot of these images that you are going to see are not even cropped they are just how they were in camera the only thing that i sometimes crop is by changing the aspect ratio if i want a three by two or a one by one or a 16 by nine that's the only reason i crop because i have lenses in my bag from seven to 600 millimeters uh, do i say that correct sorry from seven to 400 millimeters uh, so that's a full frame equivalent of 14 to 800 millimeters then i have teleconverters uh, i have a 60 millimeter macro so i have a huge huge range when i'm out on photography trips and um, i never have to crop afterwards because when i'm on location and i'm thinking i just want that i just get a bigger lens you know and don't think you can go any bigger than that uh, for example the white one that i've used for a while the 150 to 400 it has a built-in teleconverter and you can easily use an extra teleconverter on it without harming the image quality that big so you are looking at a lens that is able to shoot up to a 2000 millimeters full frame equivalent and that is just ridiculous distances if you're shooting like that a lot of other things are coming in like uh, like the weather heat waves in in uh, in the sky all that kind of stuff so to get a small bird in a big frame it's perfect but for example for me as a landscape photographer that is about the reach that that's the maximum i can't go any further than that and i have a lot of these images in here so let's quickly dive in and i will show you uh, a lot of images what this thing is capable of so this is only shot with the mark ii camera over the past six months uh, first i want to state one thing it looks like a minor thing but they actually changed the dials on this camera to rubber dials if you look at the om1 these are plastic dials and when i was in sweden in january i didn't have the mark ii yet i just had this uh, om1 and i actually noticed that i couldn't feel the wheels with those big uh, arctic gloves on and with this camera it's much much easier so it's a detail on the outside but it just works perfectly and a couple of other changes are 14-bit uh, high-res uh, images there are no blackouts anymore when you're uh, shooting in burst mode so uh, for bird photographers that is just amazing uh, the focusing got better so there is going to be an update on the original ohm one as i'm told uh, but that uh, that works perfectly uh, on this camera but i'm not a full-time bird photographer so i use it more for landscapes and nature and an occasional bird as it comes by um, another thing the live g and d filter you're going to see a couple of shots of that it's just amazing so let's dive in and uh, look at those images so first we're going to look at a couple of uh, wildlife images that i shot uh, for example uh, this uh, duck here they're actually not wildlife images but i shot them in a place where a lot of these birds are at a falconer so um, uh, also this uh, little kestrel amazing uh, little bird and you can see that the details in this image are just really ridiculously high and um, also in this one if you look at the eye of this bird here you can see all those those veins running through it uh, I didn't even see it on location but when i got back home and i noticed that yeah that's that's what you want from a camera to capture those uh, details here another one of these bee eaters a little mouse uh, really difficult to photograph you have to get it at real high uh, shutter speed so raising the iso and i think this was shot at about iso 3200 so there is absolutely no problem in raising the iso to iso 3200 or 6400 especially with uh, the modern uh, software the ai noise reductions in topaz uh, lightroom they work perfectly and you don't have to worry about that at all uh, i don't see a problem in it anyway but if you have a problem with it the software will 
be able to fix it anyway. Yeah, another shot of that mouse, also with a high ISO number. A uh, little owl sitting uh, on a leaf here. But the, the best thing about this camera with the bird uh, recognition mode, the burst mode, uh, pro capture, you know, all these features allow you to get the perfect moment when you're out photographing a bird. So um, this one was in flight. And you can see with this background around it, it still gets a little bit difficult to uh, get the bird in the right spot. And you can see here with this owl that it was quite difficult to focus on the bird due to all those reflections in the water. It's a white bird with kind of the same colors as the water. So this, this was a little bit of a struggle, but you can see that the camera still managed to catch that uh, snowy owl here. But as soon as the birds are up in the sky, even a white bird with a white bluish sky, it gets that shot every single time that you press the shutter. It just gets the bird in focus uh, straight away. And it's just a pleasure to use this uh, yeah, with flying birds. Um, I was actually quite surprised and I'm not a trained bird photographer. So um, there are probably people that can do this even way better than I do. But just to show you what it's capable of for someone that doesn't have this as his core business. Um, this is what I also do when I'm out at a photo fair for OM System. And there's one thing I want to state with this video. I am an OM System ambassador, but what I'm telling you is my own opinion. I have been using cameras from Olympus and OM System for over 30 years. I started when I was a teenager. I'm 41 right now. I have never used a different brand than Olympus uh, OM System cameras. Uh, I've bought them all with my own money. Um, yeah, so that, that's what I want to state. I am uh, free to give my own honest opinion here. And I just love the products that they made. And that's why I became an ambassador about two and a half years ago. So I'm not an ambassador because I got all this stuff from them. No, I already love the brand before that. So I want to state that. But when I'm out on those, those fairs, uh, I often uh, get cameras that are in JPEG settings so people can uh, see the images. And I have a couple of images here that are purely shot in JPEG. So this one of a flying bird, really, really difficult bird to capture. It's really fast. It's difficult colors with that green background. So the camera really has to uh, do the maximum to uh, get that uh, focus right on this bird. Uh, another one here, JPEG of this uh, owl sitting on a tree, uh, the same owl on a little uh, branch. These are all birds from a falconer that we use uh, often at a photo fair. But these shots, uh, these are some of the first shots when I got to test the camera out in, I think it was the end of December uh, 2023. That was the first time that I got to test this thing. So I took it out, uh, shot a couple of JPEG uh, versions with it. Uh, also here the macro shots uh, with, with this uh, butterfly here. It's all JPEG straight out of camera. And recently I was out on a trip and somehow I just got the wrong settings in. So I didn't shoot any raw files. These are all JPEG. So I put a couple of landscape shots in. Uh, it wasn't the best morning. But you can see that the camera is still able to capture all those details, all that light. You see it's a dark foreground with a light sky. Even in JPEG, that's not a problem. Here some beautiful golden light on this tree. And here these deers with this uh, tree. This is actually a panorama. So these are two JPEGs straight out of camera, only attach them together. And this is the, the final result here. So there's a lot of things that um, uh, you can do even in JPEG mode if you're a JPEG photographer. I would almost always recommend using the RAW files. Uh, they are just extremely good and you can really uh, pull the maximum out of these images uh, when you're uh, post-processing them. And yeah, sometimes you just can't get an image in a JPEG version, especially when uh, the dynamic range is getting quite high. So you have really dark spots, really bright highlights, then it's going to be quite difficult to get that in a JPEG file. But in a RAW file, you can do much, much more. So uh, one of the key features from 
the OM system, uh, I think only OM system cameras have this feature is the live ND filter. So you can see a good example here of the live ND filter of this bridge. I really smoothened out the water with a, a long exposure here. Uh, also a little night shot here. This is actually a stack of multiple exposures. So I exposed about 15 shots uh, from bright to dark and then pulled them together in Lightroom to get this uh, uh, amazing result here. This one is also from uh, Tuscany. Uh, also uh, a couple of exposures that I stacked together uh, to get this uh, beautiful result. But you can see all those details here. Uh, it's just an amazing uh, image. Here another key feature of the OM1 cameras. Only OM system cameras have this feature. It's called Live Composite. So it's really nice. Uh, you can just yeah, put the camera on and it starts recording some frames and it just changes the light. So the composition stays the same, the overall lighting of the image stays the same, but it only adds the lights that are changing at that moment. So you can really see the cars going by here uh, on this trail yeah, due to this uh, nice feature. So it's also really good for fireworks. Um, uh, all kinds of night shots with, with lights, uh, a very uh, a fairground, you know, uh, a big wheel or uh, anything like that, an amusement park, something with, with those big lights. Light painting, a uh, really, really good example of it. Or for example, lightning. This is a shot from Tuscany where I used live composite to capture all these different uh, light rays um, of lightning. Probes, I don't know how you call it in English, uh, lightning strikes, <laughs> something like that. But um, these are not uh, all together at once. These are all separate ones that the, capture, the camera captured into one uh, specific shot. And I wanted to take a lot more of these images, but the weather got so crazy where I was standing that I just had to run. I just couldn't dare risking my own uh, uh, safety <laughs> for taking more shots. Um, Macro, uh, really, really good due to there is uh, the Micro Four Thirds system compared to full frame has just a little bit of a shallower de depth of field. And due to that, macro photography is really, really easy because you can really get that subject in focus in one shot. Um, there's also a way to focus stack. So you can focus stack images with this camera handheld. Uh, even so, uh, here are a couple of examples of a normal macro shot with the 90 millimeter uh, macro, I believe. Uh, here you see two of them. I used that bouquet in the background. Uh, there were two butterflies sitting quite close to each other. Here another one, and you can really see all those hairs on its face, on the eye. All the details are there. And this is actually a handheld focus stacked image of a, a butterfly. This was a, a dead butterfly from a museum that I really zoomed into with the 90 millimeter and the two times teleconverter and then took this focus tag. So this is the wing of a butterfly. And you can see all those yeah, little panels that are on its wings that you can't even see with your bare eyes, but the camera can see it and even record it and uh, make an image of it. And the big lenses, uh, this image is shot with the 150 to 400 big wide lens uh, at 500 millimeters. So uh, you can also use the big telephoto lenses for macro shots like this little wasp species that was putting his eggs apparently in this caterpillar here. Or this, uh, yeah, also with the 150 to 400 amazing details even with such a big lens. So there's not even a reason to switch uh, lenses all the time. Yeah, this is the example of the new feature. So the Mark II has a new feature called the live G and D filter. So it replaces the G and D plates uh, that you put in front of your lens. Uh, of course, there's always a maximum of it that you can use it for. And in some occasions, uh, people will uh, still need to use a glass plate. Me, myself, I never used this glass plate. I always take high-res images or make uh, stacks, focus stacks, bracket stacks, and then put that together. Uh, I like that more than using this glass. But since the G and D filter is in the camera, 
I noticed that I started to use it much more. So maybe I'm just too lazy to put all those filters in front of my camera. But um, of course, some filters you can't do without. Uh, for example, a polarizer. Uh, if you want to do a real long exposure, then you need a big stopper like a 10 stop MD filter. And I recently uh, got a new one uh, from Case, which I will showcase in a couple of videos. Uh, I've, I've made some content for that. But um, there are uh, that's the, the cases that I use a filter myself. But to put those glass plates, the GND filters in front, I never, never do that. So this is an example where I use the GND filter upside down. So I made the foreground darker in this case. Uh, and that upside was already dark. So I put that together and then also made a focus tag. So uh, front and the back, everything into focus. This is another uh, GND filter shot. So I've put the GND filter on top here um, yeah, to uh, get the maximum effect and don't get an overexposed shot by that uh, rising sun up there. And in this case, I just put the GND filter on that dark line here so the upside is a little bit darker than the foreground. And you can see that you can get an amazing result. So I, I use this stuff when the dynamic range doesn't fit into one particular image. Then I start using all these features that are in the camera. But I don't have to trouble myself with filters in front of the lens and stuff. No, just push the button, add a little setting and bang, there is your image. You can't get it any easier than this and it's just the the fun and the joy is back in photography with this kind of uh, features in the camera so here another one of uh, a day earlier where that that yeah mountain was lighting up with that beautiful uh, red light and i just used that gnd filter to make that top side a little bit darker to get that dynamic range right in this image so and here is even a panorama with the GND filter. So these are six shots, all with the GND filter on, stacked together to one big panorama. And um, yeah, why uh, I don't use these glass filters? Um, yeah, maybe I'm just lazy. <laughs> I don't know, but uh, um, it's just really nice to have it in your camera. Just take your images, get up, take another shot. You know, it's so simple as that. And why I don't really like to use the glass filters or even GND filters, if you put that filter in here, you get a straight line here over the horizon. But you can see those trees are above that horizon line. So the top side of this tree is a little bit darker than the underside of this tree. And in this case, I lit it up in post-processing. But in these cases, I often choose to take a bracket. So I take multiple exposures, stack them together, and then you get a, a perfectly balanced shot with a sky and a foreground. But in this case, to make a panorama with stacked images, it will get you 40 to 50 images that you need. It's gonna be difficult. So that's why I chose to use the live GND filter in this one. And um, this is also a morning that, that shows uh, one key feature of the Micro Four Third system. And that is the flexibility. So let me see you, show you, these are all images shot in one particular morning. So I started out with a wide angle panorama here, uh, took an ultra wide angle shot here with the seven millimeter lens on it. Uh, then I zoomed into a, a nice tree here with the uh, 100 to 400 lens with some beautiful backlit light on it. Uh, the 150 to 400 lens also for a little woodpecker that I came across. And then I photographed a couple of birds. So everything that I can photograph from seven to 400 millimeters, I was able to photograph it during this morning. And it's actually the same here in, in Tuscany, beginning of this year. Uh, beautiful wide angle shot. I think this is about 12 millimeter. I think this is shot with the 12 to 40, but you can get everything in, but then you can see in the back here there are all these islands popping out of the fog everywhere so what you need to capture that is a very large telephoto lens so i had the 150 to 400 with me and you can see that you can get amazing shots when you start zooming into all these uh, particular spots 
this is a shot at about 100 millimeters so this is probably shot with the 12 to 100 lens this is again with the 150 to 400 and this is also with the 150 to 400 so i'm constantly switching lenses uh, to give me the maximum flexibility that I could ever need when I'm out on photography. This is some other images from Tuscany. This is a high, uh, sorry, a handheld high res shot. So it's a 50 megapixel shot. Uh, and I often do that to get all that dynamic range in. So it makes it a little bit easier to edit. Here another shot uh, with the 40, sorry, the 150 to 400 of this island in the back. Um, and you can you see that the birds are still all in focus here uh, in this island and you, th these are images that are just really really far away um, this also a handheld shot uh, 12 to 100 lens on and um, yeah i just like the atmosphere of this one one of the only images that i took at lago di garda that i actually really liked so uh, i just wanted to show it in this video but i was also in switzerland with this camera and with those large telephoto lenses, uh, just look at this. This is a mountaintop, um, a beautiful sunrise shot with a large uh, telephoto lens. And here you can see a wide angle shot uh, of that same uh, spot. So the first shot that you've seen was only this section here. So that's what I shot with the 150 to 400. And this is probably shot with a 12 to 40 lens, something like that. So you can see that the power of compression uh, you can see that the moon in this shot is really, really small. And um, when you start zooming into uh, it, you can see that the moon gets a lot bigger. So you can also use that advantage of those big lenses to get small things bigger in your frame. There's also a mountaintop on the other side shot with the biggest lens that I had with me. Here another one. And look at the moon in this shot. You know, this is 500 millimeters zoomed all the way out. And that's what I mean with compression. You know, the further you zoom, the bigger you get elements into your uh, into your photo. Here, another one of the 40 to 150 shot um, of a beautiful uh, hotel here with some nice light uh, behind it. And a nice island here, again, with the 150 to 400. And that's what I'm just trying to do, constantly switching these lenses to give me the maximum flexibility and to be able to capture every shot that I see during the day when I'm out with this camera. And um, of course, can you shoot these with other cameras too? Yes, you can probably. But imagine uh, taking a shot like this. This is at 500 millimeters. That would mean that you have to bring a lens like this on a full frame camera. As a landscape photographer, you're never going to do that. So because these lenses are so small, I can take everything and I can uh, adjust myself to everything that I see when I'm out on photography trips. And that's why I'm not only shooting landscapes, I'm shooting everything. Everything that I see, what I like, I want to be able to photograph. And that's what I love about this particular system. The another one, a handheld high res shot again uh, of this beautiful cave here in uh, Switzerland. So really dark. But the camera was still able to capture all those details uh, in this shot. And this was in the Netherlands again, um, where I'm using this, this ultra long lenses to get rid of the sky in these images to only concentrate on this beautiful light. And you can see uh, that above here, the tree line ends above here. So by stepping back and zooming into these areas, you can just catch only that magical light and not that, that dark sky above it. And the deer in this image was just lucky that it, it walked in there. Uh, another image of this deer. This is actually the same day uh, we went out to photograph some tulips after this. So um, yeah, beautiful tulip field here with uh, one red flower in. And I could only get it with the biggest lens that I had with me. I tried using a wider angle. But in the end, I just wanted to isolate this one red tulip in that white field. Uh, this is another trip of that same area, but a different, uh, a different time that I got there. Yeah, once again, by this is a bit of a wider lens. I think it's a 40 to 150 that I used here. Left the sun out on the left side to catch only that beautiful light. 
And then I started walking back with bigger lenses to isolate all these uh, things. So a friend of mine walking by only with this beautiful light in it, a deer that I came across, uh, another tree here with a little bit later on that day where the, the, the fog was starting to rise and creating this magical uh, atmosphere here. And then the deer walking underneath that tree. It's just a, a bo little bonus that, uh, that you get at this uh, particular moment. And this was one of my favorite trips of 2024. Uh, there are a couple ones coming in a couple of uh, weeks that are really, really awesome. So uh, if you haven't subscribed to the channel yet, please push the subscribe button, uh, especially when you're an own system user and you want to see what those cameras are capable of. But if you're interested in landscapes or nature photography, then make sure to subscribe to the channel because there are uh, new videos coming every week on location, sometimes uh, a review like this, tutorials, uh, editings. I just do whatever I like, what I think you like, and I try to fill the channel with that. So these are ones from uh, my favorite morning in this year. So you can see the beautiful atmosphere here, perfectly captured with this camera, not a single problem at all. So quickly switching to a higher ISO here to catch this bird without it being out of focus due to movement. Uh, so raising the ISO within a couple of fingertips and then I could get this shot at I think ISO 3200 if I'm not mistaken. So here another one with moving ducks in it. I always use higher ISO levels on these images and there is still really really lot of details in this image and not even much uh, noise. And if I compare these two cameras, uh, image quality wise, they are exactly the same. Um, they've got the same sensors, it's exactly the same. But somehow I have the feeling that the handling of noise in this camera is just a little bit better. But it can also be that in the past six months, the photo editing software has improved its noise handling. So. The amount that no that noise that is still in the images is not a problem at all and you can also see it on those prints that i showed earlier that there is no nothing wrong with a 20 megapixel camera you know if i always say to people if if it is the truth that you have to have a 40 megapixel camera so every photographer in the world that photographed from before 20 20 10 maybe uh, 2015 before that, all those shots we can throw away because all these shots that were taken back then are shot with lower megapixel cameras. So it's a race of bigger brands, uh, big, bigger, biggest. And I think it's absolute rubbish. You don't need that. You just need a good camera that can get really, really sharp images. So I always say the glass in front of the camera is much more important than the body itself. So if you want better images, better quality, better sharpness, invest in some beautiful glass. So I only have Pro Series lenses uh, myself, but also with other brands. Uh, yeah, the, the glass is the reason an image is quality-wise better. So the camera doesn't really do that. But the camera does have these nice features that you can use to get more creative things in your photography. So this is it. Uh, like I said, I just love this camera because it brings me back joy and flexibility in photography. And I just love every single bit of it. Is there one thing that I would like to be improved to this camera? Yes, of course. I always have wishes that I would really like uh, yeah, really like to be added. For example, a focus tag uh, ends up in a JPEG file. It would be really nice if that could be a raw file in the future. And it would be really nice, and I'm probably quite demanding here, but it would be extremely nice if those features like the live ND filter, live GND filter, high res modes work together. So you can't use a live GND filter with a live ND filter at the same time. But imagine if it could, you can get some amazing images and then catching that in a high res file. You know, that would be absolutely amazing. So who knows what the future will bring with, with faster sensors, 
uh, microchips, all that stuff uh, in the bodies. Absolutely amazing. So this is my experience with this camera. Uh, as you can see, I'm only positive. And once again, this is my own experience. And don't ask me uh, how I compare this to a full frame camera, a Canon or a Nikon or a Sony or whatever. I have never used it. I have only used Olympus cameras in my life and I'm just really, really satisfied with this brand. So there is absolutely no need to change that for me. So um, yeah, I hope that <laughs> that answers that question. So uh, yeah, thanks for watching. And once again, if you like it, uh, please push the thumbs up button, leave a comment and push the subscribe button underneath the video if you didn't already. And yeah, I just hope to see you on the next video back on location here in the Netherlands. And I have a couple of uh, really nice videos coming up that I already recorded. So uh, yeah, I've been quite busy over the past few weeks. So uh, hopefully you will be joining me and uh, I will see you next time. So thanks for watching. Bye bye.